Good morning. My name is Kit Sheehan. I'm teaching today. Before we get started, I heard sometimes you hear things in the news and you hear something here and something here, and what's the same thing is here. You get different different perspectives. Happen to be looking on the on the internet is God punishing the United States of America? Well, I don't know if it's America alone, but the whole world is having troubles. Uh, but this guy from Jerusalem Post and his thing got on on MSN.com talking about uh, I'm certainly not one to dare to assume to know what goes on in the mind of God I believe in, and considered a bit arrogant to go down that path. Nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> at the risk of being labeled an old fool is a challenge for me to believe that the series of plagues that have befallen the United States of America of late are not part of some heavenly master plan and then he goes into uh, the different different things uh, uh, like between Republicans and Democrats um, and uh, oh the big thing about shooting and uh, uh, weather and Homeless. I mean, all these things are really caused by man. Um, it's right. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, but it's it's true that uh, from different places, I've heard that there's. Uh, I guess they're calling it excess deaths. Um, that that um, I saw that on some show on TV that uh, there seemed to be from all causes an increase in the number of people dying re recently. Um, another guy that I know that's uh, tied into uh, a, uh, a, a funeral home uh, said that uh, that's what the guy at the funeral home was saying is that there's an unusually number, large number of people dying lately. Um, so uh, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> um, it could be that God's answering our prayers and, and that, uh, uh, okay, uh, I'll get rid of, the, of uh, all those people that it's, it's their time, but. Uh, uh, maybe there's, there's well, I mean, you look at uh, uh, crime in Chicago. I mean, you hear that on the news from time to time of all the people uh, uh, getting killed there or other cities. Or um, we have a neighbor that uh, that moved from San Francisco after she was knifed by a homeless man and decided, uh, uh, I, think it's t <laughs> I think it's time to leave. <laughs> We're getting knifed and uh, uh, just other things. And... Um, uh, I mean, when, when, when on the internet uh, for San Francisco, they have a poop map. So here's the areas to avoid because there's what hu human, hom the homeless people are doing on the streets. And, and uh, yes. uh, just, it's so, so frustrating. Um, anyhow, it's just, uh, uh, we pray for our country um, and uh, uh, God has a plan and uh, uh, we're in that plan and we and we're walk by faith and so God takes care of us and uh, uh, there may be a storm, and uh, maybe we'll survive. Um, well, let's go in prayer here. Thank you, Father, for the freedom we have uh, in the in our country to study and teach. We pray that we know that we're in trouble, but we know that you can can uh, solve the problem with uh, in amazing ways. Uh, we pray uh, for me, Father, that you'll give me words to speak. Uh, your words, uh, your your message. Uh, pray for our church, uh, for the people we have in, in the church, uh, for protection in the angelic conflict, and to help us move forward. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. So um, I got stuck on on uh, typology. I figured last week was an easy one, uh, especially if someone already outlines the, the stuff for me. So I, I decided just to, to get a, a different one. Uh, but before we started, I wanted to um, uh, give you a concept uh, that you may be familiar with, is that, and I'm, I'm gonna, just going to paraphrase probably that first paragraph, um, is, is that um, sometimes you can say something uh, without saying it. Uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, Bruce Lee's uh, fighting without fighting. Uh, so the idea is that you can say one thing, but you're making somebody understand what you're really talking about. For instance, if you have a loved one that's in surgery and the, and the surgeon comes out and says, I'm sorry, he didn't say that the person died, but you understand that. And so he said that in a gentle way. Um, 
um, or, and you can stay uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, um, you, you, you use different words uh, and I try to come up with a with a description of that and all I can think of is circumspect um, but uh, anyhow I think that will factor into what we have uh, in our, our lesson today um, and so Jesus does this from time to time to veil the fact that he's the Messiah, the God-man come to ju be judged for sin. He didn't hide that fact, um, but he didn't always he didn't uh, uh, put that in the Pharisees' face all the time because uh, they were always trying to find some way to kill him. Uh, uh, and, and in a couple of places, he escaped uh, even though they were going to try and stone him. And that act they actually tried that in John ten thirty one. He was surrounded by these uh, Jews, and uh, uh, I forget what the, the conversation was, but uh, um, they decided that he had blasphemed by, uh, uh, I mean, in some places, Messiah, uh, uh, before Abraham was, I am, uh, and other things that uh, pointed to he was the Messiah, the God man. And, but uh, so uh, he, he sometimes talked circumspectly or in parables. Um, uh, so and, to, and, and sometimes he uh, um, he had he had to do this in order to wait for the right time. Uh, my time has not yet arrived. So, in uh, but it's interesting that in John, I think it's chapter twelve, where the Greeks or the Gentiles come to him and want to know about Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus says, "It's my time." Um, so I'll, uh, before we get started, uh, I'll review some of the points. Uh, keep hammering at those, and eventually there's. You'll, you'll, you'll get those and you'll understand and be able to apply these when you're reading the Bible, that you'll understand that there's different ways of, of interpreting so that when you get to something, you say, well, that's not the same as that. Well, it is if you understand how he's comparing things. And we'll see something tonight with typology. But you've got the, you know, we covered uh, in one or two lessons, the direct fulfillment, you, where you have a, a prophecy and, and uh, God fulfills that exact prophecy. So he says it's going to happen, and then it does happen. And what we have tonight is the, it's a literal historical event applied typologically. It's a pattern. So this pattern over here is fulfilled over here. It's not a prophecy, although some would say it's kind of like a prophecy. And then you have an applicational fulfillment. We saw that in Acts chapter 2, where you have a principle. In, the, in that case, it was the principle of a change of a dispensation, and that happened in, in, in Joel and then in, in Acts chapter 2. And then you have the summary fulfillment. That was going to be a toughie. I may even may just go over that, but uh, nobody, I, I think, has, uh, has gone over and, and, and tried to weed out uh, uh, when, when the prophet, when the, when the text says, and the prophets say, well, where did they say that? How, how, what's the logic behind that? Uh, it's something that uh, he couldn't just jot down and say uh, it was in this passage or that passage, but a series of passages, and so there's a probably a logic to that. But I don't know that I've seen that anybody actually try and, and, and figure that out. So we'll, we'll see what, the, what God reveals. Okay, now let me ask you a question. In these different uh, titles that you have here? Yes. Uh, does God, does the Word of God always say what He No. Uh, but that part of, and that's what I'll get into, one of the things here is that there needs to be some way um, that uh, I, I think uh, which, who was it? I don't remember if it was Roy Zuck or somebody else that said that there's two ways the typology is uh, uh, is is uh, uh, done. One is uh, um, explicit, uh, and there's actually places where they use the word typos, type, um, and there's things like tonight where Jesus says, uh, I will give you a, the sign of Jonah. Well, so he's pulling up that thing from his history and saying, I'm going to be like that. Um, so there's, there's, there's somebody pointing to it. Now there's other things that you say, well, this is like that, and this is like that. There's this correspondence. So maybe that's a type or illustration. It's similar. For instance, uh, I, I taught uh, a couple of Sundays on, uh, on uh, uh, John chapter 4 uh, and the correspondence between that and, and uh, Genesis 34, the rape of Dinah. Uh, the, the correspondence is, is incredible. 
everything in one is, is mirrored in the other, maybe flipped in, in, in backwards, but, but it's all there. So is that a type? Um, I don't know. But so we'll try and, and stick with, uh, I, I made some criteria, which is uh, uh, what, what I've got down here. So uh, um, I, I presented this last week, uh, these characteristics, but I thought I'd go back over them. And then at the end, we'll see uh, 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 what, this type that we have from Jesus, uh, the, the sign of Jonah, um, and, and uh, how is that uh, played out in, in Christ's life? And, and how does that correspond, or, or does that work with these, these categories that I put up? You know, all in, in uh, Revelation 15, the whole thing is about the Word. Uh, the, the book. The book. The book. And, uh, but nowhere does he ever say, this is the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's one of those things where you just gotta um, um, uh, allow God to reveal to you, or maybe it, maybe it won't be revealed, um, that there is a book and you can put down characteristics of it and, um, uh, it, we know that there is the, the what is it, the book of life or the, the our names are in this book but not in that book and um, uh, so we know there, there are books uh, however uh, I don't know if God has, has gone digital or if he's still got paper <laughs> or something completely different so anyhow I'll go through these uh, um, we're, we're talking about uh, typology here uh, so this is like that um, it's not something that's fulfilled in the sense of prophecy but it's a pattern uh, so here's the pattern over here and th that pattern is is over here um, and after studying uh, for today's lesson it just uh, I had a, a, a greater appreciation and and uh, uh, perhaps I need to, need to go back and, and look at uh, uh, at some of these types uh, I'm, I'm probably trying to finish up typology today and then next we get into uh, application. Um, but it, it just, it was amazing some of the parallels. Uh, because when you talk about three days and three nights uh, in the earth or three days and three nights in the belly, well, it's not about the three days. It's about what happens afterwards. And I mean, if it was stayed in the earth, okay, it was dead. Yeah, but you didn't die. And that's the point is that uh, where we go back to that uh, uh, the saying what you want to say without saying it and so so he says three days and three nights well what's implied there is that he, he's going to be resurrected um, and uh, but I'll get into that here uh, so some of the characteristics I, I've taken some of this from uh, Roy Zuck and a couple other places uh, trying to identify how do you come up, how, how do you identify a type what 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 characteristics does it have um, and, and it's important because um, there, uh, um, you can get off uh, or come up with something that, that's totally um, not in the Bible if you say, well, hey, well, that's kind of like this and this is kind of like that. And, and uh, so some of the early church fathers would, would say, well, there's the church. Well, the church isn't in the Old Testament. Uh, certainly there may be a pattern in the Old Testament, uh, but there's no... no prophecy uh, uh, that as we know the church is a mystery it's not in the Old Testament so you have to be careful so how do we um, uh, how, how do we avoid that well so if we have some tests or characteristics so the first one is just a basis we know that uh, uh, God's character does not change and uh, you might say that man's character doesn't change we have a sin nature um, now those that uh, of us that are believers we have the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, make use of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, uh, but uh, so there there are similar situations in the Old Testament and some in the New. But God is using those in in the Bible. Historical. That's the most important part. Is that both the Old Testament type and the New Testament type are historical. They're real events. They really happened. And that there's a correspondence. Point three. Uh, so it's not just something. Well, that's kind of like that. Well, this and this are similar, and this and this are like, and this and this, so that you see these correspondences. And again, that uh, I saw that amazingly in, in John chapter 4, uh, corresponding to things in, in Genesis 34. And it's on the, the internet. 
if you're interested. And, and uh, um, prefiguring, uh, a type has a predictive or foreshadowing element to it. It looks ahead to and anticipates and points to the antitype. A type is a shadow that points ahead to another reality. The Bible is Christ-centered as a result of typology centered around the person and work of Christ. Heightening. What happens in the New Testament is better than the Old Testament in for the types. Uh, so you see uh, when, when Christ refers to something in the Old Testament, it may be in perfect pattern or, or a pattern based on a man that has a sin nature, but Jesus does not. And designated, I think that's, uh, that's important. Um, you, you have to have some way of, uh, how do I know that this, this points to something in the Old Testament? Well, the one for tonight, or this morning, um, is, uh, Jesus says, uh, the, uh, uh, I will give you the sign of Jonah. Okay, well, then i got to go back to Jonah. What's that sign? The three days and three nights. What's happening over there? And some of the correspondences that I found were kind of interesting. And then application. What's the principle? What's, what's, what's going on with, with this type? Uh, Roy Zuck says there is divine design. There was a reason God, up, God set up that type and any type. That these weren't just uh, uh, coincidences. Uh, God set things up, and Jesus, in, in this particular case, says, that's, that's what's going to happen to me, something like that. Types are not mere analogies. That's the word I was trying to think of. Uh, um, or illustrations which Bible readers note. Instead, they are resemblances planned by God. The type was designed by God to be fulfillment and heightening of the type. He even goes on so far to say a type is a form of prophecy. Prophecy is prediction by means of words, whereas typology is prediction by correspondence between two realities, the type and the antitype. Uh, uh, my, my personal view is that there's a principle applied or a concept illustrated. So what, what is it, like I said, the, when Jesus says three days and three nights, uh, there's three days and three nights because something happens after that three days and three nights, and that's the point what he's making. But again, he's veiled that so that if they if they think about it, he didn't say, I'm gonna be resurrected, uh, but that's that's in the type. So uh, we'll get to that now. What, the, one of the notable types, I went through a list and I said, well, that, I'll pick this one. And, and uh, so I studied it and I learned a lot uh, by studying it. But most concentrate on, on uh, uh, Matthew 12, 40, where, where uh, I will give only the sign of, of Jonah. Uh, um, so I could just point to say three days, three nights. See, he said that, said that. We're done. Not exactly. This, uh, um, now, this is often used for determining what day of the week that Jesus was crucified on. That's a different topic. I'm not going to touch that. I'm trying to get what's the type here. Uh, Jesus was communicating some information to the Pharisees and scribes, some overtly and some indirectly. This type contains both. Oops. Um, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, oops. I got off. Uh, I got lost here somewhere. Right there. Yeah, okay, there we go, both. So there's other information that needs to be considered in the book of Jonah compared to the situation found in Matthew chapter 12. There are actually five sources of information uh, that provide a panorama with what Jesus said. There's the, the quote in Matthew, or the, 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 uh, and there's the, the parallel uh, passage in Mark, uh, one in Luke. And uh, what I've forgotten is that there was a reference to Jonah in 2 Kings. Uh, and that, that uh, I had totally uh, either, if I knew that, I forgot about it, or uh, it's just something, sometimes you read stuff and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go back and say, well, wait a minute, I missed something there. Now I understand. Oh, and I, I said, uh, okay, well, uh, I didn't realize I said this, but we can get out our, oh yeah, I needed to get the whole context here. So if we get out our Bibles and go to Matthew 12, and then we'll read from uh Verse nine to forty-five. They'll get the whole the whole passage here because uh, there's things happening that we need to understand. Matthew twelve. Yeah. So it's 
a, it's a lengthy passage, but I, I wanted to make sure that you got the whole the whole text here, um, because uh, uh, later on they say we want a sign. Well, he's already healed somebody uh, in public. So what is it they're looking for? Well, they're not looking for a sign. They're looking for something to trip him up and call him blasphemous and kill him. But we'll start with verse 9. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So, they, so that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? He then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. They, 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 he just healed a man. Oh, we got to kill him. Huh? That's how... how, how uh, tunnel vision when you're when you uh, have an argument with a, and logic and all of a sudden you end up with a with a contradiction you neither you need to go back to your assumption or to your logic one of them is wrong uh, but they they uh, nope we're right doesn't matter what we else we see and uh, I mean you see that kind of logic today even doesn't matter what we see this is what we're going to do okay but Jesus aware of this withdrew from there Many followed him, and he healed them all, and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Interesting. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not be put out until he leads justice to victory, and his name the Gentiles will hope. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and uh, uh, was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This, this man cannot be the, the son of David, can he? And knowing their thoughts, he said to them, and we'll skip, uh, we'll skip down to verse 38 now. Um, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it uh, but the sign of prophet Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment. And will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment. And will condemn it because she came for the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And, and, uh, and we go on to the um, unclean story. So, uh, But uh, the point is that uh, they, there has already been a sign. And, and we notice the references to the Gentiles. I thought that was interesting. So uh, here's some information from what we've read. Uh, point one, uh, Jesus already performed a sign by healing a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. But because it was a Sabbath, it must be wrong. Uh, Jesus healed many people. The miracles authenticated who he was and continues to be. Prophets in the Old Testament and apostles in the New Testament had gifts used to authenticate them as being sent from God. That's why they wanted a sign, except that they don't care what the sign was. They're, they're going to kill him. The result was that the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. They did not want to determine if they should worship him. They already decided he was a threat and wanted to destroy him. No matter how many signs he does, they will only want to kill him the more. All of the Gospels indicate that. The proof of that is the crucifixion, when they actually killed him. There's another fulfillment passage in this context which quotes Isaac from Isaiah 44, 1 through 4. That's the first of the four suffering servant passages in Isaiah. That's not the topic of this lesson. As you see, there is a great deal of information, many details which are part of the fabric of Scripture, which are, there's no time here to deal with all that. Uh, I'm trying to just focus on three days and three nights and what, what that pulls in. 
So let us focus on the contents of uh, the verses 38 through 45 passage and understand what Jesus is doing when he references three days and three nights. Going back to verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. If you've learned a foreign language, you know some people say, Oh, say a few words in Arabic. I want to hear it. Well, they won't understand it. You could you mumble something. And, oh, is that Arabic? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but so they all they want is that they just something. Uh, so the scribes and Pharisees, uh, these were the religious leaders, and they also were leaders in Jewish civil matters. But uh, a key thing is the, the Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees, another important group. Uh, of, of Jews, uh, which was represented in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, did not believe in resurrection, and so they're not even mentioned here because the point is resurrection. That's the word that's not mentioned. It's like uh, that, that phrase, the elephant in the room. Nobody mentions the elephant, uh, but everybody knows the elephant is in the room. <clears throat> the, uh, so the point of three days and three nights is that afterwards Jesus would be resurrected. They didn't want to believe this would happen, thinking that disciples would steal the dead body and then claim resurrection. So the chief priests and Pharisees had Pilate post guards at the, at the tomb, and that's in Matthew as well. Then, because of their effort to prevent the disciples from stealing the body, the guards verified the actual resurrection. So they had proof, witnesses. Then they had to bribe the guards to tell them a different story, a lie. So even this sign doesn't convince them. They know the truth in spite of what their lying eyes tell them. Uh, Matthew 28, 2. And behold, a severe earthquake occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I'm jumping the gun here, but I need to make this point in connection with the Pharisees. The point of the sign is not just that Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, but what happens at the end of that time. He's resurrected. He's alive again. By trying to prevent the disciples from providing an illusion that Jesus was resurrected, they actually proved his resurrection. That is the point of the sign. Okay, I'm repeating myself, but I don't want you to miss it. Teacher, they, they, they referenced, uh, they, they, uh, a sign of reverence, uh, they call him teacher. They didn't call him rabbi here, but, uh, uh, but all, although Jesus did not attend any rabbinical st school, I've got rocks in my in my mouth today. I think. <laughs> um, uh, who's that guy? Uh, Plato or Sophocles? They put rocks in his mouth because he couldn't couldn't speak, and so he would uh, go out to the shore and and uh, try and speak, and so he became a great speaker because he had to had to uh, practice. So I need more practice. Maybe <clears throat> they were fearful of the possibility that he would lead a, an uprising against Rome and cause them to lose power, prestige, and prosperity. Uh, and we saw that Caiaphas uh, essentially prophesied that in John chapter 11 in that, that passage. Uh, but they constantly tried to trap him in some error. He always had an answer that confounded them. It's interesting that here they did not call him rabbi, only teacher. Sign. A sign is something unusual like a miracle or healing that would mark Jesus as empowered by God. As, as I've said, uh, uh, it's like a credential. Uh, oh, okay, he can... He can Heal blind people. Only God, only people that were empowered by God could do that. There's a, a, a former professor at, uh, at Dallas, uh, Eugene Merrill, uh, had an interesting uh, definition. He says, the full import of the term samaya, and that's the, the Greek word for, for uh, sign, cannot be discussed here, but its basic theological meaning is well known. It is a miraculous act produced to authenticate, authenticate, its agent and to induce faith in God on the part of the observer. And I put there, it's available on the internet. Uh, that website, uh, uh, where, where, e, e, ET, etsjets.org, uh, you can go there and, and you don't have to sign in, you don't have to, there's no paywall, um, and you can download all kinds of articles. It's interesting for those that are interested. So the Pharisees needed to see his credentials from God. He had been doing this constantly throughout his, throughout his ministry. What, have you not been looking? Have you, have you not seen? They wanted a sign done on demand. 
What they really wanted was to him to fail so they could discredit him. We want. This is not so much a request as a demand. I looked at it, it's not subjunctive mood, it's not the imperative, it's in the uh, uh, act, uh, present active indicative. Uh, they, this is, they really want this. Uh, careful what you ask for. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So there's our link. Uh, Jesus specifically says, like Jonah, I'm going to be like Jonah. Uh, and uh, evil, this is a word we've encountered in the book of Judges. We see that over and over again in the Hebrew version. Um, and that's, that was uh, a problem. And as we saw, it's not just some immoral act. It's the abandonment of God. And, and uh, you don't have to be uh, immoral uh, to abandon God. Some of the legalists that have checklists that say, okay, I did this, I did this, I must be good. Or we saw one of the Micah when he said, well, I, have a, I have my own personal priest in violation of the, of the Mosaic law. But God, that's my rabbit's foot. God's going to bless me because I have my own priest. Well, he was evil. <clears throat> so just as bad as perhaps worse, this legalism refined by the Pharisees. Because of their threats to put out those that don't abide by their teachings, people would obey them and hence end up going against the true intent of the law. Being put out is like uh, is being put out of the temple. Essentially, it was like being excommunicated. Adulterous. Well, we saw that again in the Old Testament. So Jesus was using Old Testament terminology. Uh, so D.A. Carson, in his uh, commentary on Matthew, adultery was frequently used by Old Testament prophets to describe the spiritual prostitution and wanton ap apostasy of Israel. And in several passages. Here, Jesus applies it to his contemporaries, as did his brother James later on. Israel had largely abandoned her idolatry and syncretism after the exile, but now Jesus insists that she is still adulterous in heart. And that, like I say, is not just immoral, immorality, but it can be legalism that's against, the, uh, against God, uh, trying to, uh, to please God on your own uh, efforts. Uh, God doesn't want you to, to what's the... Uh, all our all our righteousness are, are filthy rags. Uh, I won't go into what the filthy rags is, but it's not good. Um, uh, so uh, um, God doesn't want our efforts to please Him. He wants us to trust Him. Uh, and so, generation Jesus is talking about the people of His day, the sign of Jonah the prophet. The book of Jonah from which Jesus is drawing his information does not identify the three days and three nights and the sea monster as a sign. Jesus is the one who is telling us it was a sign of some sort. And here we have uh, verse 40 in, in uh, Matthew chapter 12. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And there's two perspectives to this sign. On the one hand, it was assigned to, to the sailors on the ship to, uh, of what God did to and for Jonah. There was this terrible storm that threw Jonah over and, and the storm dissipated. He said, wow. Uh, and he spent three days and three nights in the fish. And then he was vomited up by the fish. He was brought back to life, as it were. From the, from the sailor's perspective, when he got swallowed by the fish, that's it, terminated, end of story, finished, dead, no. He came back to life. <laughs> but how is that possible? So let us first deal with the Ninevite perspective. In order to do that, let us take a detour first to Luke, then the Second Kings, then the book of Jonah. That's the fabric of Scripture. We're just tracing all the information. Luke eleven twenty nine. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. Uh, Verse 30, for just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. So, so here we get a little, oops, we get a little extra information. Oh, I don't know. Um, James. Um, 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 um. James. Soft, soft, there we go. Um, 
So let's go back to the uh, uh, book of Jonah to glean some information from there. This guy, uh, uh, I'm not sure I pronounce his name correctly, Joachim Jeremias, has an, Ill has an illuminating comment in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament on the name Jonah, which of course comes from the Old Testament. Uh, the story is his quote, the story of Jonah provided plenty of opportunity for fantastic embellishment, and the figure of Jonah was greatly magnified in later Judaism. He was supposed to be the son of the widow of uh, uh, Zarephath, whom Elijah restored to life. According to the Haggadah, his flight in, jo in Jonah 1 occurred in the interest of Israel. He wanted to prevent the repentance of the Gentiles, causing God to punish the imp imp impenitence of Israel. With this in view, he offered his own life for that of his people. Our Jonathan said, the only purpose of Jonah was to bring judgment on himself in the sea, for it is written. And he said to them, Take me and cast me into the sea. Similarly, you find many patriarchs and prophets sacrifice themselves for Israel. Jonah was perfectly righteous. That's interesting. Interesting parallel. Uh, I'm dying for the people. Although this Jewish view was written after the time of Jesus, I suspect that the Pharisees may have held similar uh, views. If so, they have, would have gotten... Uh, one, a one-two punch from what Jesus said. Uh, Eugene Merrill says something similar. On the basis of the Matthew account, uh, this Matthew account, they like to use different words there to confuse us. Uh, most interpreters of this phrase correctly see that Jesus is making an analogy between Jonah's three days and three nights of incarceration in the belly of the fish and Jesus' confinement to Sheol. Equally correct, many go on to suggest that Jonah's miraculous experience is a prophetic type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, or Christ. In Luke, it was also assigned to the Ninevites, and I found this was very interesting. Eugene Merrill suggests that resurrection from the fish was assigned to, the Ninev to Nineveh. He shows that the name Nineveh comes from the name of the fish god. He suggests the name of Nineveh, fish town, is highly intriguing then in considering the meaning of Jonah is assigned to Nineveh, a matter to be elab elaborated presently. Assuming there was a witness that followed Jonah to Nineveh or some other evidence, this sign would have gotten the attention of the Ninevites. Prophets needed credentials. Apparently Jonah's credential was three days and three nights that he survived in the belly of the fish. And here's uh, Eugene Merrill's conclusion on uh, his little essay. Since the Lord Jesus, according to both Matthew and Luke, spoke of Jonah as constituting in himself a sign to ancient Nineveh, a sign so persuasive that the population from king to peasant repented, something in Jonah's experience must be found to provide adequate explanation for his effectiveness. Now, you put your finger there. And, and uh, uh, I always wondered, how, how, did, how did this guy just walk into, into Nineveh and... and, and uh, the end, you know, all those people who have the sign, the end of the world is near. Well, who's going to pay any attention to that? Well, he had to have some end, some credential. Well, here it is. Fish town. I, I was just, th I was in a fish three days and three nights. In your, in, in, in that fish is like your God. So your God brought me here to you. In Matthew, attention is drawn to Jonah's having been in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. But since Luke specifies that Jonah was assigned to Nineveh, that experience in the fish must have communicated to the Assyrian capital and have become to the Ninevites a sign that Jonah was a divine messenger. Such a sign would be particularly convincing to a people whose etiology, that's the study of origins, we came across that word last week, uh, taught them that their city had, be, had been founded by a fish god. The spectacular and timely arrival of Jonah among them created a curiosity and receptivity to his message that would have been possible in no other way. When the truth of the message of God was then proclaimed, the response was the repentance and faith recounted in the sacred text. Jesus, basing his own appeal for the repentance on this account, argues a fortiori that if the pagan Ninevites repented at the preaching of the foreign Jonah, so much more ought his own generation to repent, for a greater than Jonah is here. Since the Jewish traditions of Jesus' time knew of the connections established in this paper, his own use of them in reference to his resurrections is not at all surprising. Matthew 12, 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here. At this point, I need to make another detour. 
going to that passage in 2 Kings that I was totally surprised. Jonah's in, in Kings? How is that possible? I thought he went to Nineveh. Well, first he was a prophet to Israel. It says so. Uh, in 2 Kings 14, 23. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king of Samaria and reigned forty-one years. So Jeroboam is the Jeroboam the second who reigned 793 to 753, according to Eugene Merrill. In the next verse, 2 Kings 14, 24. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not repent from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son uh, of Naboth, which he made Israel sin. Evil. This is the Hebrew word uh, for the, the, the same uh, word, essentially, that used the, uh, Jesus uses in Matthew. This is the Hebrew version. Uh, if you go to the Septuagint, it uses the word that Jesus used for, to translate that Hebrew word. Um, so he made Israel sin. And as went the king, so went the population. So that generation was evil as well. So you've got the, the generation of, of Jesus was evil, and you have the generation of, of uh, uh, Jonah was evil. Uh, so then the next verse, 2 Kings 14, 25, he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. So, so it starts out that Jonah was a prophet to Israel to start with. And guess what? So was Jesus. I did, Jonah. I didn't remember that Jonah was mentioned outside of the book of Jonah. But here it is. Before Jonah went to Nineveh, he was a prophet to Israel. He prophesied something that they would do. Now here's the, here's the kicker. Uh, Gath Hefer. This is a town in the tribal area of Zebulon. There was someone else we know that, that, had, that lived in that area. Because the city of Z uh, Nazareth is also in that, that area. Near this town of Gath Hefer. So if they'd lived at the same time, they'd have been almost neighbors. There's a little map, uh, and the map didn't come out right. Uh, the, little, the, the little red circle is supposed to be around Nazareth and, and, and Gath Hefer down, down here. So you see Nazareth, I mean, just real close to it is, is Gath Hefer. Uh, now, I've overlaid that. Those are uh, hundreds of years difference. Uh, but uh, that's the idea is that they're from the same area and I thought that was is that coincidence? Mm -hmm. So here's, a, here's a, some information I tried to put this together uh, without getting too much detail um, so we have the childhood location both Jesus and Jonah lived in the tribal area of Zebulon Jesus lived at Nazareth and Jonah was at Gath Hefer if they lived at the same time on a map they would almost have been neighbors Jesus, when growing up, would have been familiar with the area that Jonah came from. Prophets to Israel. Both Jesus and Jonah were prophets to Israel. Jonah, Jonah was a prophet. Jesus was the prophet. Jonah became a prophet to Nineveh. Uh, Jesus became the focal point of Christianity. Uh, point three, uh, ministry to Israel and the Jews. Both Jesus and Jonah focused on a ministry to Israel to begin with. Jonah's ministry was interrupted and God sent him to Nineveh, a Gentile nation after the great fish vomited him up on land. Jesus' time had come when Gentiles became interested in his ministry. After Jesus died and was resurrected, his disciples went to the Jew first and then the Gentile. But the Jews rejected Jesus and the ministry of his, of his uh, disciples. Uh, and The king in Jonah's day continued to make the people sin. Jonas was sent to the Gentiles. Both their ministries changed from Jew to Gentile after their deaths. The length of death. Of course, we were uh, both were dead for three days and three nights. Jonah was not actually dead, but the crew of the ship that threw him overboard probably thought he was dead. I mean, if, if you get you know, overboard, uh, thrown overboard, uh, whether that was a shark or a whale, gobbled him up and said, that's it. <laughs> so... Uh, well, if it's a submarine. <laughs> well, they didn't have submarines, uh, but uh, 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 but yeah, he did. I mean, that that could have been. You might say the first that that was an organic submarine. <laughs> so, um, uh, Jonah was not actually dead, but the crew of the ship that uh, threw him overboard probably thought he was dead. 
The sign was that he was eaten by a fish. Jesus was identified as son of man in the heart of the earth. Jonah was identified as Jonah in the belly of the great fish. Jesus actually died, was buried in the heart of the earth, and then resurrected. He died that all mankind might believe and be saved, to live spiritually. Jonah was only assumed to be dead in the belly of the fish, and then was vomited on dry land. He died to save the ship's crew and passengers that they might live physically. It is reminiscent of substitutionary death. When the Pharisees dug into the nuances of what Jesus said, it should have hit them like a ton of bricks. It was as if Jesus said, I'm going to die a substitutionary death for the, for the nation, be buried for three days and three nights, and then be resurrected. Afterward, Jews will reject me, and salvation apart from Judaism will be available to the Gentiles. Bam! But they weren't thinking of that. They were thinking, how do I kill him? The substitutionary death was already on their minds, even if they didn't fully comprehend it. And that was... Uh, with that passage in John where Caiaphas uh, uh, says it's better for one man to die for the nation. And then there's a little thing there that says uh, he didn't realize perhaps that uh, he was prophesying uh, that he, because he was the chief priest that year. Uh, point five. Corrupt rulers. In both instances, the people in power, the king in Jeroboam II for Jonah and the Sadducees, Pharisees, and scribes for Jesus, caused the people to sin by enforcing a false religion. The name of Nineveh. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Nineveh was named after the fish god, which was part of the sign of the Ninevite saw. The fish god brought him to Nineveh, for Jesus was in the heart of the earth. Often the term earth in Hebrew is Ha'eretz, and sometimes that's referred, that's the, the name of Israel, Ha'eretz. Um, for in reverence, Jonah was more revered in Nineveh than he was in Israel. Jesus is more revered by Gentiles than Jews. The documented life. The life of Jonah was written about in the book of Jonah. The life of Jesus was written about in the four gospel accounts. Preaching. Apparently the Jews of Jonah's time didn't listen to him and repent. Uh, obviously because you've got the, they continued to, to sin under Jeroboam II, even if they had some, some success in battle. But Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus compares himself to Jonah, saying that he was greater than Jonah. The Jews rejected Jesus and did not repent. Yet, starting with the Gentiles that approached Jesus' disciples in John chapter 12, Gentiles uh, revered Jesus and many repented and believed. And then there's the, the, I didn't get into the Solomon part, but Matthew adds the comparison between Jesus and Solomon. History records Solomon as being one of the wisest men of history. Yes, Jesus was greater than Solomon. Jonah, of course, was not considered wise. So Jesus had to go to Solomon for that comparison. Uh, Jonah had to, had to argue with, with God about, well, how come you saved these people, these terrible, terrible people? Well, that's the point. We're all terrible people. We all need salvation. And then, of course, he has that, that story about the plant, where the little plant grows up, and, and, and Jonah is really happy with it, and the sun comes and it goes down, and, and why, God, did you kill my little plant? Well... <laughs> So there's a whole, there's a lot more to that story. Um, so uh, let's let's look at our qualifiers and see see how we did. So uh, the basis God used prophets to communicate His message to men. Both Jonah and Jesus were prophets that God empowered and authenticated in similar ways. Check. Historical. Both events are historical. Check. Correspondent. Uh, there are multiple correspondents. Check. Prefiguring. Jesus applies this to himself. He indicates it is a prefiguring. Check. Heightening. The antitype is, is Jesus is better than Jonah type. Check. Designated. I didn't make this up. Jesus said, I'm like Jonah. In the application, Jesus applies this to himself. The three days and three nights was a sign. Jesus himself tells us the application. However, a greater application is God has a plan. He does what is necessary to enact his plan. So here God provided a sign to authenticate the prophets and get an audience for their preaching. In both cases, Gentiles listened, but Jews did not. Check. Oh, I just, I was, uh, threw in some extra words here, trying to come up with, uh, when you say, when you say something, but you don't say it. Uh, it was disguised, hidden, elusive, stealthy, evasive, masked, disguised. I didn't like any of those words, but I still put them down there so I can remember them, and uh, maybe someday I'll come up, and maybe there is no word in English that says exactly what I want to. Uh, but I didn't know of uh, any other words, so. Any questions? Yes. Do you recall uh, that is Nineveh 
What is modern day Nineveh now? Is it Iraq or Iran? You know? Um, I thought it was Syria. Uh, is it Syria. Syria. Uh, I, I I don't remember now. Betsy said Syria. Yeah, it may be. It may be. I um. I'll have to. I'll, uh, but, I, like, I knew at one time. I just can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Modern day. Nineveh is modern day. Yeah. I'll, I'll do like what the White House does. I'll get back with you. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's always interesting to know what modern where yes, they yes. are in, in the modern. Yeah. Modern well, world. I I did that with uh, with uh, essentially Nazareth and and Gath Hefer. Um, and I didn't, I didn't expect to see them next to each other. Um, I, that was just that uh, close, that close yeah. together in the same. Uh, and I had been dealing with tribes, thinking about uh, the the book of Judges, and and uh, just happened to dawn on me: where is that Gath Hefer? Oh, that's an area of Zebulon. Well, isn't isn't that uh, near Nazareth? Oh, yeah, it sure it is. It's right next door. Okay, let's end it's in kind prayer. Of an oh, interesting. It's where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. Yes. Yeah, and, and so I can imagine that, uh, 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 well, it's just like uh, um, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my father uh, uh, grew up in uh, Illinois, a place called Ohio. Ohio is the name of the town of like population 500 then, it's like 300 now. Um, <laughs> but uh, and they were south of, of Dixon, Illinois, where, where Reagan was. So we went and visited there. But it's like uh, I don't, I, I doubt that uh, Jonah's house was still standing, or they knew where it was. But uh, that's where I'm sure, with their understanding, their um, um, their focus on monuments and stones and altars. That, uh, that someone would have told Jesus, this is where Jonah came from. Um, uh, just like uh, when you go to Dixon, this is where, this is Reagan's house. And I, uh, my wife and I went there. Um, I took my wife to the Ohio, Illinois. Um, and we went to the cemetery and they have corn growing everywhere. They have a post office and there's corn growing as weeds right outside the post office. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess corn. Uh, Nineveh is a city in Iraq. Iraq, Iraq. okay. Thank you. Um, okay, let's end in prayer. Thank you, Father, for uh, your word. Uh, so many wonderful things in there that we discover uh, because you reveal them to us. Uh, we ask you to help us take these lessons to heart that we read the Bible we have better understanding and, and more confidence in your word knowing that uh, uh, it's your word uh, it has life in it uh, we're grateful Father for the time we have we ask you to bless us in this church for in Christ's name we pray Amen